Hello, everyone. How great it is to be back together again. We have just come over the one year anniversary of starting our MAO live events, and we are so thrilled to be here still doing this, whether you're getting in or staying in, getting out or staying in. It is so great to be back here. Um, no, Margo, you're covering your face. We can't see. I, I know. I'm just doing a little adjusting. Uh, anyway, we've only been practicing for an hour. Now we're adjusting, but it's all good. We are just so thrilled to be here today and to bring to you a really great presentation um, with my good friend and colleague, Margot Anton. But before we get started, um, please put in the chat where you are coming in from and any questions that you have for Margot. We're going to have time at the end to answer those questions. And then we have a little bonus gift for you all. So just so you know, Margot is um, an, a very accomplished artist. If you don't follow her, you know that she does some most beautiful jewelry and there might be a little extra, extra bonus gift at the end. So make sure you stay. And um, the other things that Margot has done over the years is different types of mosaic art. And I'm sure if you haven't seen them, you're gonna see some pictures of them today along with her presentation about her nomadic lifestyle. So Margot left her home in Edmonton, Canada about seven years ago to go live um, outside of Canada. And she's gonna share more about the stories and the scandals and all that kind of stuff. So I am gonna turn it over to Margot. We're gonna have a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. Again, put your questions in the chat and I'll actually see them. And we will ask Margot them and then we'll have a little a party at the end, a little extra, extra party at the end. So I'm going to turn it all over to Margot Anton and her live event. Hello, everybody. Um, so I actually call myself a different word than a nomad. I am a peripatetic mosaic artist. And I'm a big lover of words and I recognize not everybody is going to understand what that word means, but the definition of it is traveling from place to place, in particular working or based in various places for relatively short periods of time. So I'm sure the question on everyone's mind, how the heck did I end up peripatetic? Well. In fact, I have been traveling because of Mosaic from the beginning. Um, every year I have been attending a conference put on by SAMA, which is the Society of American Mosaic Artists. And my first conference was actually in 2005. And this conference is held in a different city across the US. Each year it travels to another place. And with the SAMA conferences, I quickly began being involved um, with more than just attending. I was also presenting, vending, and teaching at SAMA, and also at other venues in Canada and in the US. But how this current bout of travel, which is now seven years, um, began in 2014. And just prior to that, I had a house, I had a nearly dream teaching studio, although I'm sure my students would have liked for a little more heat than we had in the Canadian winters. And um, possibly a little running water would have been nice too. But um, it ended up getting sold as a result of a divorce, um, doing what divorce does. So I decided to take some time before traveling to figure out what I wanted to do. And um, I decided I would travel. I had had a love of travel in my 20s, but really hadn't had means or opportunity to do travel since that time. In particular, I had not been to Europe for 18 years. So I ambitiously chose to start in Turkey and head westward across the, along the Mediterranean. I put all of my worldly belongings in a storage unit and at the time, I wasn't yet thinking of working as part of travel, and I was needing a break from creating. I didn't even bring my own jewelry. The only goal was to actually go and look at mosaics, see all those mosaics with new eyes that I had seen earlier but wasn't yet a mosaic artist. That trip got a little 
little bit sidejacked, sidetracked. And I actually tried to say hijacked and sidetracked at the same time there. That was great. <laughs> And what proved to be a turning point was when I got to the island of Santorini in Greece. I intended to stay for four days, which is a long time in one place based on how many places I wanted to see. But I ended up staying five weeks. I made lots of friends. I made a lot of uh, expat friends in particular. Um, and the people I met there taught me that life didn't have to be lived in one place and that different sorts of lives were possible. I even had the no work mantra kiboshed when someone asked me to make a mosaic tabletop for their villa that they were just renovating. And so I agreed to do that as well. And so then I started thinking in the back of my head, is there a way that I can forge this more international, interesting type of life for myself? But before we get to that, here are a few of the mosaic highlights from that trip. So first off is the Hagia Sophia in Turkey, in Istanbul. Istanbul has loads of mosaics, but the Hagia Sophia was my favorite. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's functioned as both a Christian church and a mosque. It was a museum when I visited, but last year it was actually reverted back to a mosque, though they have no plans to cover up the mosaics, um, which they did cover up during the first conversion to a mosque, and then later it, they were uncovered when it was being turned into a museum. And people can still visit it, so that I'm, I'm pleased to know about. One of the reasons I really wanted to visit Turkey was to visit this museum, the Zygma Mosaic Museum. It is chock full of mosaics from an archeological dig called Zygma. And they had to hastily recover these mosaics because a dam was being built that was gonna cover over the archeological site. And not only was it an amazing collection of mosaics, beautifully organized, some of them were in situ. I would actually say as a result, this was one of the best museums I'd ever been to, and not only because I have a huge love of mosaic. In addition, the Gypsy Girl mosaic on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen is what really people know and recognize internationally from this collection of mosaics. Obviously, Venice was on the list with its beautiful smalty manufacturing there, and I had known some of the Orsonio employees from attending the SAMA conferences. And so I got to meet them there and I got to get a tour of the factory, got to hang out and have a little bit too much wine one evening with them. Um, I also saw the beautiful mosaics in and around the St. Mark's Cathedral. And I just fell in love with Venice. I also stayed there longer than intended. I'd planned three days and stayed five. Not quite as much as the four days to five weeks, but. And then of course, I had to see Ravenna as all mosaic artists should. Um, not only is it the best collection of Byzantine mosaics in the world in numerous locations throughout the city, but there is also a fabulous collection of modern mosaic masters there as well and modern mosaic museums. Um, it seems like every quarter you turn there's another mosaic. Um, it's just an incredible, incredible place to, to visit if you're a mosaic artist. As you can probably guess, I got home to Canada and I decided I wasn't finished. I sold all of my belongings out of that storage unit. Side note, never do this. It was literally the worst month of my life. What the dream was at the time was to live three to four months in a variety of places around the world, selling my work both in person and through galleries and hopefully doing some teaching. I decided to focus on jewelry at that point. I was already kind of known for the jewelry a bit. So I decided I needed to like laser focus on that because I needed to be able to take all my tools and materials with me. I obviously needed to be working small and what is smaller than mosaic jewelry. And as you can see, I, uh, um, 
started out with a travel kit that weighed 25 pounds. For those of you in metric, that's uh, about 11, 11 and a half kilos. And slowly, as I figured out what I actually needed, that got whittled down further and further until you get to my current kit, which is only 15 pounds, or again, for our metric folks, um, six and a half, seven kilos. I also realized I didn't really need a large workspace. Mosaic jewelry doesn't take a lot of, a lot of space. So all I really needed was a small table and chair. My smallest work surface was in fact, the size of a TV tray. Um, and when I first started, I house sat, I visited friends from SAMA, and I started do by doing some teaching both in Canada and the US. I began to create my jewelry based on the things that I was seeing, using my travels as inspiration. Um, I actually did some selling to tourists. Sometimes I just meet them at the local pub. Uh, although I did actually have one waitress who um, she, I mean, this woman would just wear my jewelry and sell it as she was waiting tables during the day. And they would meet with me and see what I had. This woman could sell work to just about anybody. It was amazing. So where do I spend my time? How does this all kind of fit together and work? So here are some of the answers to those questions, plus some of the highlights from the past seven years. Um, this presentation does kind of jump around a little bit here and there, but so do I. <laughs> um, the conference put on by the Society of American Mosaic Artists, the American Mosaic Summit, is the first thing to go on my calendar every year. In fact, when I arrived at the 2014 um, summit in Houston on April 29, that was my first day of being nomadic. Every SAMA, I teach at least one class and I always sell my mosaic jewelry and jewelry supplies in the vendor marketplace. Um, I've also done some presenting as well in the years. I think I've presented three times since becoming nomadic. And a couple of years ago, I managed to find a chunk of time I pretty much need to be in Canada to do this, to make a fine art piece in my shag rug style. I was thrilled for it not only be, to be accepted at the Mosaic Arts International, which is a juried competition that runs concurrently with the SAMA conference, but I, and I also won a juror's choice award. My international um, start actually came before my nomadic start when I was um, offered an artist teaching residency in Thailand at an international school. My best friend Blythe was working at this school as an English and drama teacher and it's a, a school that while it is in a foreign country um, the language of study is all in English so it's run like um, an American school or a Canadian school or a British school. And so she approached the art uh, director and said, hey, I've got this friend, we've got this new artist in residency program. I think she'd be a really good fit. How about we bring her in? So they agreed to bring me in for a three week stint to teach mosaic to their middle school and high school students. And we decided we would create mosaic murals. Now, the materials were a huge struggle and they ate up a ton of time. Um, I think it took me about a week to acquire and prep materials for these, um, which I was doing on residency time. So it cut into the time that the kids got to mosaic. Um, and I vowed to never do that again um, because it was like, is this thin set? is this not thin set? I can't, you know, the, the writing isn't even in letters that I can, can guess and, and easily sort of say, okay, yeah, that looks like it could be um, thin set. No, I just had to go buy the pictures on the bag. Thankfully, those were pretty good. And the tile I used was all this paper backed um, glass tile that was pretty thick, not super easy to cut. And it was on this mesh that I had to just rip it off of, it wouldn't soak off. 
Um, so I had these raw, raw fingers from doing that for the better part of a week. But the results were worth all that effort. These kids would come in on their lunch breaks and they'd be singing songs from the latest Pitch Perfect movie and um, to get these works done in the two weeks that they got to actually lay tile. And so here's the unveiling of the middle school project. And on the right hand side, we have the project of one of the high school classes, which is the um, school mascot of the Phoenix. And then another project that was based around the theme of unity. My second residency was also aided and abetted by Blythe. Blythe was rather lonely in living in Egypt, which was a new school for her. And she asked me if I would be interested in coming to chill and hang for a while. And I was nursing a broken heart at the time and I needed two months to get some work done before heading to the next SAMA conference. So I thought, sure, why not? So while I was there, Blythe decided to start uh, to stay in Egypt for another year. And at that point, she approached the director of her school about having me do an artist residency there. He did not have the budget for that. But the, materni the, the arts teacher was going on maternity leave. Would I be interested in being a substitute teacher for the art teacher for two months? So I was hired in this capacity to teach high school students. Um, I ended up designing a whole six week unit around making mosaic, um, which I'm honestly not qualified to do. I have no secondary training in education. Um, and it was really weird to have to grade students, um, but great students I did. I did luckily have a happy materials accident this time. I was really worried about it after what had happened in Thailand. And um, the art teachers weren't even sure if we were gonna be able to find much of anything to work with. And then I get there and the art teacher says, so is anything in this cupboard useful to you? And she opens it up and sitting there is 150 to 200 square feet or about 20 square meters for you metric folks of premium quality stained glass I'm like, yeah, pretty sure I can make this work. And make it work we did. Again, the um, students did uh, small murals based around themes. So we had a theme of friendship and a theme of the environment. And then another group had um, travel and then Egypt. And the school was so pleased with the work I'd done with the students and how well I was doing in the classroom, which um, amazed me because there was more than one time I lost my temper on these kids, um, that they asked me to fill in for their full-time substitute teacher for two months because he had to go on medical leave. So the, um, I was allowed to use my free time to create art in the art room and so that's how I ended up teaching math, chemistry, English, and Spanish in a high school in Egypt, amongst other subjects, because I was a substitute teacher. I learned I don't remember any calculus. Um, much of my income, and what also makes travel cheaper for me, is to teach. Um, a lot of mosaic artists do teaching tours and so forth, but I think it actually might be my favorite part of what I do, um, which is kind of understandable as I come from multiple generations of teachers on both sides of my family. And when my nomadic life started, I'd been doing the occasional workshop down in the US and in Canada, though I was obviously teaching mostly locally to Edmonton. Um, but the nomadic lifestyle really made it more appealing to start doing a teaching tour where I go and hit numerous places um, and not so much back and forth between home and somewhere else. When you don't have a permanent residence, this makes a lot more sense. And the US was a natural place to start. I was also one of the first visiting instructors for Mosaic Arts Online. And I have a 
couple more workshops simmering in my brain for when borders open and I can go film again. And uh, just, I'm about 99% sure that a few margaritas and possibly a dozen oysters were consumed before Tammy snapped this photo. Oh, you, you really aren't going to bring that up, are you? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, if you are a teacher here at Mosaic Arts Online, it does come with some very good perks. So when I got the chance to teach and present at the MANS Symposium, MANS is the Mosaic Association of Australia and New Zealand, um, and their symposium is kind of the Australian version of SAMA, I just leapt at the chance. While at the symposium, I made numerous contacts in the Australian Mosaic community, and so I booked a teaching tour for after the symposium. Well, that teaching tour was a resounding success, and every single venue wanted me back for a second go-round of workshops a few months later. So I made the decision that I was going to head up to Southeast Asia, hang out for a few months, and then come back to do tour number two. I also made a fabulous number of friends and in particular found a home away from home in Glenbrook, Australia with Marion, um, with Marion Shapiro, who has become like family to me. So I was really excited after that teaching tour to get back to, uh, I mean, after that tour in, in Southeast Asia to get back to Oz for my second teaching tour. And I was arrived at Perth and I presented my passport and I got pulled over by immigration. They had researched me. They had a one inch file on me and um, they uh, knew I'd been working and they knew I came, was coming back to intend to work. And I had not secured the proper working visa. I had hadn't dawned on me, hadn't dawned on any of the venues that I was teaching for that maybe that was something we should look into. So anyways, I got deported. And um, I spent two days, 48 hours almost exactly, in Australian immigration detention. And um, people often ask me what that is like. And let me tell you, in my case, I know this is not the case for everybody. Um, it was like staying in an upscale hostel. There was a big screen TV and a little library and three square meals a day. There were arts and crafts classes and cooking classes and availability to exercise. Uh, <laughs> I've often said, if that place served wine and had a pool, people would pay to go there. But anyways, I get deported back to Bali and um, Marion Shapiro was lovely enough to contact all those venues um, to tell them that I was not going to be making it to teach for them. She was also really devastated at this point that I wouldn't be able to visit Australia for three years because that was the thing. After getting deported, they said in three years, all of this goes away you'll be welcome to apply for any visa. And if all your ducks are in a row, it will be granted. So she was so devastated that she suggested we go live in Ireland together for a month. So in 2017, she and I spent a month in Listowel, Ireland and just created. I worked on pieces inspired by the local countryside. Um, and there was a lot of green in those pieces. Um, although I did have to create a piece based on the sunset that welcomed me to Ireland, as you can see. And Marion created uh, lovely, interesting, fine artworks based on um, not only the countryside, but also some beautiful work um, based on certain folk tales from Ireland. And she was adamant that I apply to return to Australia as soon as I was able to. And so after a lot of nail biting, a lot of worry, and a lot of forms, I applied for an Australian working visa on the first day I was eligible. I was in Malaysia still when I received the news and promptly burst into ugly tears in a coffee shop. 
And at that time, it also meant a reunion with this guy um, who was my then new Greek boyfriend. Now he's just my boyfriend, it's a few years later, um, who spends winters in Australia, um, or rather he spends Australian summers in Australia. It's very complicated because of the different hemispheres. And so I've done two teaching tours since being allowed back in, one in 2019, one in 2020. And in fact, I was in Australia when the pandemic started. Um, but in 2019, I even taught this monster class of 26 students. Um, it's a, a theory workshop and you work in a workbook and, and stuff. And it, uh, man, that was, that was a rough day. <laughs> Um, but all work and no play, um, what am I saying, I love what I do, makes Margot a dull girl. Occasionally I need to explore. So here are just a few of the places I've managed to get to since all of this began. Um, Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia were the countries I visited in between Australia the first time and trying to get back unsuccessfully to Australia the second time when I got deported back to, from Bali. And as you can see, I take a lot of inspiration from these travel excursions that I do. Santorini isn't always for me. And I end up there for at least a chunk of time every year. It is truly a home away from home. Ironically, the least amount of time I've spent on Santorini um, annually was actually that first year five, which was five weeks. Um, other years have been at least two months and one year I actually spent five and a half months on Santorini, split between two, two visits. It really is ridiculously beautiful. And I am trying to arrange a workshop there at some point, like a week long. I am struggling with a venue, but I shall persevere if anybody is interested in keeping uh, up to date on that, please feel free to drop me a line. Um, there was also a kind of an Asian exploration tour in 2018, Sri Lanka, India, Thailand, and Malaysia. And two of those were with Costa, my Santorini boyfriend. Um, as you can see, it was fun for me to have a photographer for a change. One thing about solo travel is there's a lot of selfies and a lot of, um, a lot of photos without people in them. And so it's really nice to, when you can have somebody who you feel comfortable saying, hey, take a picture of me. Um, I spent Christmas in India that year and so donned a sari for Christmas Eve. And I actually I did manage to get some work done while I was on the road that time in Sri Lanka. And uh, the lovely proprietor of the, um, the hotel I was staying at would always bring me juice and even loaned me a little USB fan to plug in my, to, a little USB fan that plugged into my computer to keep my face cool. It was so hot. Um, kind of in the, the mid eighties and I was just kind of dying, poor Canadian me. I do spend some time in Canada um, and I do try to see some of the country when I'm here. I've been lucky enough to see the Rocky Mountains four times in the past five years, especially last year when domestic travel opened up. And I've also spent time on the East Coast and the West Coast. So kind of everything but the middle. <laughs> um, the problem with being in Greece, as much as I am, is that there are visa issues. And trust me, you do not want to play with those, as I learned the hard way once upon a time. Most of continental Europe gives a collective tourist visa that allows you to stay on continental Europe for 90 days every 180 days. So this means if I've stayed three months, I got to get out of Dodge for three months. And there is no way to extend this. There is no way around it. Yes, it makes a relationship a bit awkward at times. So occasionally I have to get out of Dodge in order to get back in. So this solo trip through the Balkans was one of those. The Balkan countries, or at least most of them, most of the former Yugoslavia countries are not part of that group of countries that have this visa issue. Um, and since I wanted to stay in Santorini until October, I needed to kind of get out for five weeks 
in order to be able to, to stay as long as I needed to in Santorini. Um, but you know what? I ended up just falling in love. It was historically interesting, beautiful and cheap and the food was good. And let me tell you, I think half the time I travel to eat um, because that's one of my favorite parts about being in these other countries is all the amazing, amazing food. So yeah, I can't wait to get back to the Balkans. It was gorgeous and incredible. You should go, everybody. And because of the visa situation in Europe, spending time in other European countries cuts into my time in Greece. So I haven't seen much of Europe since that first trip in 2014. My friend Blythe is in Paris now though. So I have managed to get there for a few days once in a while. And I also got to a Ravenna Biennale and the Ravenna Biennale is a mosaic festival, obviously held in Ravenna every two years. And it's a very, very big deal. So I managed to get to that in 2017. Unexpected discoveries are some of my absolute favorite things. Um, my first time in Venice, I was staying in a hostel that I randomly chose. And I was go as I was going back to my hostel the first night, I caught my, my, I got caught by a shop. Um, it was closed because it was fairly late at night. And I'm like, hey, that looks like Duciana Bravura's work, who's a well-known mosaic, Italian mosaic artist. And lo and behold, I had randomly stumbled onto her shop in Venice. And the next day I met the shopkeeper who was not Duciana, but rather her best friend, Manuela. And Upon hearing who I was and that I was really interested in mosaic and I did mosaic art myself, she's like, well, I live in Ravenna. Are you heading there? I'm like, yeah, that's kind of my next stop. She said, well, um, text me when you get in, we'll hang out. And so that's how I ended up, you know, going to the beach with her and dinners. And, and she came and picked me up an hour and a half after I arrived in Ravenna. It was amazing. So it never ceases to amaze me the people you meet and how happy they are to, to show you around and, and enter your world and have you enter their world. And this micro mosaic table that I discovered in a museum in Adelaide was absolutely astounding. There's also pebble mo mosaics absolutely everywhere in Bali. And even my beloved Santorini had mosaics that I didn't discover until my third visit there. Um, one of the things we actually liked about living in Egypt, and there weren't actually that many of those, was that we could escape to neighboring places. So we did a lot of diving. We went to Lebanon, Zanzibar, Dubai. But I booked a random hotel in Beirut and we walk in and here is this gorgeous mosaic right in the lobby. And then I knew that in Beirut was this Marco Bravura um, piece. And if you think back to when I was in Ravenna that first time, there was a very similar piece on that slide. So this is its sister mosaic in Beirut. It took me forever to figure out where it was. And it was a huge walk across town to get there. When we get there, I'm busy snapping photos of it or trying to line up a photo. And these really mean looking security guards come over and they're like, hey, you can't take pictures of that. And I'm like, it's a piece of art. What's, what's wrong here? And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of a goody two shoes. And so I was like, oh, okay. But my friends Blythe and Katie were like, no, she's a mosaic artist. She's come all this way to see this. You are letting her take a photo. And finally he's like, okay, you may take one. I'm like, okay. And I quickly snapped five while pretending to line up for a shot, just in case the one I got was blurry. So I'll play in no work also makes Margot a dull girl. And um, I do occasionally manage to get some work done apart from teaching and traveling. I have um, some upcoming exhibitions that have encouraged me to create some fine art. Um, and though this exhibition has been moved from 2020 to 2021, we are a hope. We are hopeful that it will, it'll, it'll hang and be a, a great, great show. Um, 
And in addition to the jewelry that I produce for sale on my blog, my website, and through galleries, I also do accept custom orders and sometimes even have produced sets like the one you, you see here to commemorate special occasions. Um, that special occasion was the retirement of a number of nuns in the Sisters of Mercy order. And so each of the nuns got presented with a special mosaic in the Sister of Mercy's colors. And the one on the left was a piece I produced for my high school, uh, the high school graduation of a um, cousin of mine. And so she sh sent me a picture of her dress and she said, please make me something to, to go with my dress. And so it was really fun to have carte blanche and um, be able to make something special for her special day. And then I get sometimes some really unusual work opportunities on the road. The surfboard I made um, a few years in, ago in California and I stayed with the client while working on it. I literally took over their entire dining room because this thing was over six feet tall, maybe even seven feet. Um, and the other is a sign that I created for a villa in Santorini. I have homes all over the world now, or rather places that just feel like home. It started a course first with Santorini, but that was closely followed by my parents' place in British Columbia with house sitting. And then I fell in love with Tucson too when I started visiting Teresa Mertens there. Glenbrook, Australia has also become one, even though I had to not return to that home for a few years. And, and in a weird way, Egypt was a home for a time too. I have a couple of Edmonton homes. I suppose it could be said that I have learned how to make any place my home. And believe me, I feel very much a part of the family when I'm in these places. I have made friends with animals. I have resurrected old tables. I have cooked many a meal and shared many a bottle of wine in these places. But as much as I love the places, that's not what keeps me returning to the same places over and over. I feel lucky that I am pretty much always feel at home and homesick simultaneously. And I guess I just figure that it's the price I pay for loving people all over the globe. This life doesn't exist without the people who make it possible. And that's not actually me. The friends I have met, in Sama have put me up for a time. People I have met on the road have offered me lodging. Even people I have never met have been told to put me up and then turned into good friends. In my current case, having a boyfriend living in Santorini is also, it means my heart is always there, even in these pandemic times. I've had friends meet me in other countries. I've gone to theirs for extended visits. And even when I'm away from my, very, from my various people, I always manage to keep in touch virtually. By the way, these photos are by no means an exhaustive list. So if you weren't included in this, that was just because of time. Belongings are actually an interesting struggle between my personal work and also when I need materials for teaching. Many of the friends and family you just saw allow me to ship things to their homes, store items there, and occasionally even amalgamate packages and send them onwards. These things really facilitate the life I lead and I couldn't do it without them. I'm looking at you in particular, Teresa Mertens, and I am so blessed and grateful for their help. I also have a photo file called Belongings at a Distance with about 20 photos at it, in it and a number of lists on my phone. I currently have mosaic material stashes in at least eight places that I can think of off the top of my head. And this is in addition to a few clothing stashes, although there are more material stashes. I also have keys to about four households around the world. I was in Australia when the pandemic started. I was supposed to fly with Costa back from Australia, from Australia back to Greece, but as borders started closing and things started getting dire, an urgent family meeting sent me back to Canada where I have been living since with my sister. I did get to Santorini for um, two and a half months last 
late summer and uh, early autumn. Um, now I live with a cat who likes to help me exercise and I have a new yet another nomadic studio that I work in and I have learned the Canadian version of proper social distancing. Despite having my lifestyle completely derailed, I am oddly suited for the pandemic. I was already keeping up the majority of my relationships online. So the Zoom calls to connect were kind of a normal occurrence for me already. I'm also fairly good at handling change. If being a nomad has taught me anything, it's to expect the unexpected. And in Canada, I've had access to great kitchens, which I often don't have on the road. So it's been enjoyable to really improve my skills in that area as it's been another lifelong passion of mine. I was really excited, as you can see, when my sister scored some flour during the flour and yeast drought of 2020. I have had some back issues this year, which has unfortunately made mosaicing a bit hard. Um, haven't been able to sit for more than an hour, but I think I'm finally getting somewhere and I can now mosaic for more than an hour a day. Um, I think the hardest part for me is not being able to plan more than a couple of weeks ahead. It's a difficult thing as I've been used to planning my life a year or even two in advance. But once we are on the other side of the pandemic, I'll be getting right back out there, international woman of mystery, using the beach as my office and drinking wine with a view. I fully recognize I have been remarkably lucky and I was in a good position because of the types of mosaics that I make. But a lot of it has boiled down to believing something was really different and being uh, willing to just trust that things would work out one way or the other. Mine may seem like an ideal life, but it is not for everyone. Everything is amplified and there is no safe space and often no companion to retreat to in times of trouble, just my own head. And let me tell you, emotional problems are much harder when thing to cope with, when things around you are unfamiliar. Having said that, I could not have done any of this without the incredible support team of my friends, both Mosaic and otherwise, and a super supportive family. You don't travel to escape your life or yourself. But solo travel has had so many benefits that way out, outweigh the other things. I've done a fair bit of inspiration introspection and self growth work as part of my journey. Um, and that now shows up in my work. And I think my ever increasing self knowledge makes me make more intelligent decisions in my artwork. And that my works is coming from a more authentic place. So if you want to find me, or find out what I'm doing, there are a lot of options. There is even a Margot Anton locator on my website. I also publish all of my jewelry to my blog, Mosaic Day. And I usually talk a little bit about travel fun or inspiration, whether that be internal or external inspiration when with each piece. And when we travel, it can travel again. You're more than welcome to live vicariously through me. And if you're ever headed to where I'm at, please drop me a line. I'd love to show you around whatever home I happen to be in at that time. Thanks. Yay. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing that. That was really a great presentation. And I know it was definitely a abbreviated um, version of so much that's happened in the last seven years, because as you have come through uh, Santa Barbara a couple times to, you know, see um to to work here at the school and oh that's the best part yes here's to margo I, I, I just i just got prosecco delivery and these are i should actually she's put my darling sister has put this in just the right glass this is um glassware that i bought in egypt beautiful and it's just it's just stunning that is awesome. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's great. No, that totally ties into the whole um, story. But I mean, it's really incredible the the places you have been and the fearlessness that you have um, been able to 
tap into in a way to do the things you've done. And I'm not sure, like you said, it's for everybody, but um, I really like what you said at the end that it's just, you know, you've created more authentic work based on a lot of self-reflection and you kind of can't have that when you're traveling the way you are. So it's, it's really, really awesome and very inspiring. Let me see if we have a couple questions over here. Um, Carrie Strope is asking, what is the one place that Margo wants to visit but has not been to yet? And I'm gonna sip my wine while you answer. Um, I have not seen any of South America yet. Um, nice. Which I would just love, love, love. And oddly, um, I would really like to go to Georgia, the country, not the state. Um, <laughs> Sorry, if anyone's here from Georgia, I'm sure it's lovely too, but I would like to go to the country. I hear Atlanta's um, got some good restaurants. Yeah, and and Armenia too. I've just, those have, have really intrigued me as of late, so. Have you ever been to Nepal? I have not. That's 51 that's, countries, but that is not one of them. That That's high on my list. You weren't that far away either when you were in India. No, but I was down south and just in Goa. It was a beach holiday. Right, right. So, you know, recently your lifestyle has kind of become, if ha COVID hadn't hit, you know, Greece and then Australia to sort of like get your work done in both of those places. And I know we talked a lot about that in December of 19 when you were here, is that you were looking for that retreat space to hopefully do it in on Santorini, which I'm signing up for um, when you do figure it out, because why not? But um, were you planning anything else that you were going to try and do except for those two sp places before COVID hit? Um, not really. I mean, that was my, my life. And I mean, I'll be, as soon as we can, I'll be back to Australia to do another teaching tour. That's for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hitting a point where I need to be working on some new classes as well. Mm -hmm. because, um, you know, a lot of people want to continue to take workshops from me, but they've taken my offerings. So yeah, like, what's new? Give us more. Yeah. So, but well, we... yeah, right now the big, the big one is working on something for Santorini um, and a, a week long retreat style workshop there. Yes. And yes, you have been brewing some new ideas for Mosaic Arts Online, and we're looking forward to those becoming more solid as you do get your chance to travel here. Hopefully, you know, before 21 is over, but we'll see how things go. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Margot before we offer up our um, bonus and then bonus bonus? Because we do have a couple of them. I'll wait a couple more seconds so that we can see if people have anything um, to ask. And I remember when you were here, I have to say, you were organizing, you know, everything to go to Tucson and how Teresa and you had so many different ways and places that all the supplies had to get to Australia and all the different places. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a pretty organized person, but my mind was like, whoa, I don't think I can handle it. Yeah, it, I, I think it was like I had one box that um, I was packing everything up that was materials that could stay in the States because they would be useful for my next SAMA workshop, which never ended up happening. Um, and so I was packing up those. And then I was also trying to get another box together to 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 head to Australia. And it, I mean, it's I have circumstances where I send um, like things from five different suppliers to Teresa. She rebundles them and ships them somewhere else. <laughs> it's, it's just and, and all that information's on your phone. Like if you lost your phone, it was like, oh my God, that was like, I was like, oh God, I'm scared for you. Thank God for the cloud. Like if I ever lost the phone, I would get another phone and boom, it's right there. Unbelievable. That's the beauty of putting everything in the cloud instead of on your SIM card, peoples. Well, you have to these stuff days. stuff on your SIM card. That's right. That's so true. So true. So if you are going to these 
you know, remote places, you are depending more on shipping from your suppliers here than what you kind of dealt with in Egypt and Thailand, correct? You're not depending on your location supplies? Yeah, when I mean, I do try to source locally, like when I go to Australia, I now know who the suppliers are there of certain materials. So I'll only ship the stuff I can't get in Australia. And I mean, that makes sense because I want to be able to offer my students as local as I can in terms of suppliers for when they want to do another piece. So I do a lot of that. Um, right. But sometimes you just can't get what you want to have. Yeah. Um, and so you, you have to bring it in. And usually it's not too much. I mean, I'm teaching jewelry. It's small. <laughs> You know, a little, a little box like this is material for a class. Yeah, you went from 25 to 18 to whatever size you can travel with now. And you really, it's amazing that, you know, the amount of work that you do produce that I've seen in your supply um, of what you sell at the vendor marketplace at SAMA. And, you know, people are constantly asking me, as many of you may know, and may, some of you don't know, I'm the president of the Society of American Mosaic Artists, the place that Margot keeps mentioning that we have our conference in different parts of the country every year. And obviously we did it virtually this past February and we don't know if we're gonna physically get together in 22 yet. Everything is still up in the air and sort of figuring things out. But you always have this big supply of jewelry to sell and it's just amazing. And I know you'd be coming in from some other country when you got there. Yeah, and that's always, that's always kind of fun too because um, there was one time heading from uh, Canada to the conference that I got uh, stopped at that border. Um, and unfortunately, uh, airports in Canada are not goods ports. So they found all of my um, workshop materials on me and all of my um the things I was selling at the vendor marketplace. And I literally had to leave customs and go mail that. Um, so pri mail that to the hotel overnight. It was so expensive. And so what I have to do is before every conference, I have to mail all of that jewelry ahead to someone. Yeah. Um, in order to, in order to be able to, um, get through that border without any without yeah any just issues. to avoid avoid any issues because they yeah. are pretty ruthless nowadays yeah. um uh jean Kamiski, have you i'm guessing this says have you attended any conference by bam have you I been did. to england i attended the bam conference in edinburgh in 2017 right after my irish residency we actually Marion and I timed it so that our residency ended the day we would need to fly to Edinburgh to take in the BAM conference. And then we flew from England down to Ravenna to attend the Biennale. Nice. So see, that's a dream trip. That's a dream trip. You know, and that's what's so incredible. That's kind of, I guess I'm starting to see as a common thread with you and I is that we're reaching people all over the world. So Mosaic Arts Online is obviously doing it virtually and you're doing it physically. And it's it's not something many people can do or you know, go on about the list of places, 51 countries that you have been to. So, you know, it's really incredible to you're an ambassador. You're an ambassador of our kind of mosaic community. And it truly is not where's Waldo, but where's Margot? And I mean, what a trip this year to have you just like, you know, put in one spot in your hometown and thank God for your sister and, you know, a year to reset. It's another version of resetting like so many of us have talked about this year and you got to find the silver linings in it. Mm -hmm. You know, earlier, Tammy, you mentioned, um, you mentioned fearlessness and I wouldn't say I'm fearless. Um, and but what I am, I think, is I'm brave. And but bravery is defined for me as feeling afraid and sometimes feeling super afraid and doing it anyways. 
Well, it's interesting because that's my motto. That has been, my mom taught me that when I was a little kid. She always told myself and my sisters, be afraid and do it anyway. And when I actually launched Foundations and Fundamentals on Wednesday, that was my motto. It was like, be brave and do it anyway. And we do yeah. that. We have to jump off those cliffs and leap of faith that, you know, we're going to be okay on the other side. And uh, you got to live your life without a net sometimes. And it's kind of a very... Um, you know, what's the word? I'm not, I'm not, it's not coming to you right now, but you know, it's very gratifying when you get up, you know, you get up and keep going that way. Yeah. All right. I don't see any other questions. So on that note, we would love to present to you Margot's generous bonus gift of her two courses that she has with us here at Mosaic Arts Online. And they are her Smalty Mosaic Jewelry. As she said, she was the second visiting artist to come here and shoot a course with us and trust us with her content. And then we have our Shag Rug Mosaic, one of my favorite courses here that she um, shares how to do that effect, which is so much fun using um, small Italian small tea. So you guys have until tomorrow night at midnight to enjoy 15% off these courses with the coupon code Margo15. So please um, feel free to use uh, that code and go check out those courses. And this will be in the chat as well. Um, right now the code is in the chat. So you guys can use that. And then for those that are seeing this in the replay, they um, you can get it till Monday, April 19th at midnight. And Margo has one more offer that I can't imagine not taking advantage of and supporting Margo as well. So tell them a little bit about this while I have a sip of my wine. <laughs> so um, from Friday to Sunday, this coming Friday to Sunday, so April 23rd to April 25th, um, I will be having a 10% off sale on all of my available jewelry. And you can catch that on my website under available jewelry. My website is margoanton.com. And um, there are some really, really lovely things that you can go and eye candy you can ogle and um you can check it out and sort of preview keep in mind i actually do have a few more pieces that i'll be putting up this week um but friday to sunday 10 percent off on all of my available jewelry and does your jewelry also come with um a chain it sure does it comes um my jewelry is all set in sterling silver and most of the tesserae used tesserae for those non-mosaic people out there are it's just a unit of mosaic making sometimes you can just say tile mm -hmm. um most of my tesserae are mosaic gold so that's gold that's glass with um 24 karat gold leaf embedded in it so that's what gives my jewelry that super bling factor and um i will also uh you do get a chain in sterling silver the mosaics are set in sterling silver and that chain comes in a variety of lengths and you you get to choose your your preferred length as well and if they take your course are you still selling your custom bezels i do have some custom bezels um still working on getting a new order in for those at the moment so my stocks are pretty low but i do sell my larger bezels um so you know you can see that there's these smaller pieces that i have and then the larger pieces i sell these sterling bases that are the larger ones um but my stocks are a little bit on the low side right now but I'm happy to give anybody a quote if they want. Well, and we have other resources for the bezels as well if they do purchase your course, which is awesome. I love that course. And I took the class live when you were here in Santa Barbara. And I don't take many live um, classes. And it was one of the best. And just it's very gratifying because in a short period of time, you have a piece finished. And, you know, everybody's using epoxy sculpt now. So I think almost everyone has it in their studio. So it's just easy to get learn Margot's techniques and then before you know it you're um creating and i can see it right behind me there is Margot's piece <laughs> this is what she creates in the shag one so you can really learn the beginner skills 
of um, what she teaches to create that effect in the Italian small tea on a picture frame that you can go buy at any craft store. So both of these things are very accessible, fun to make, very gratifying. And I can't thank you enough for joining us for this lovely afternoon of learning and getting to vicariously travel with you, even though we're all still staying home for the most part. I am leaving for Mexico on Thursday for two weeks uh, to teach two retreats to two small groups, but otherwise we are staying put. So thank you again, Margo. Well, thanks for having me. This has been Absolutely. fun. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again soon.